As we stand, let's pray. Lord, thank you that you see us and hear us and know us. And Lord, pray pour out your spirit that we might see and hear and know you, expand our capacity to receive you and to see your work in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. How is your soul this morning? Is it awake, shining in the morning light, or oh, sleepy, longing for distance and darkness? Could the posture of your soul be better described as doing jumping jacks, or sitting back in bed, leaning against a collection of pillows, which, full disclosure, may be my physical posture while writing the sermon on Saturday morning? Also, never agree to preach during your own demon week before a board meeting in the midst of multiple trips. No more excuses. Um, how is your soul awake or sleepy? And what might today's scriptures mean for us this morning? I'd like us to consider three characters. Samuel, from our Old Testament reading, and Nathaniel, from our Gospel reading, and one other who will be revealed shortly. But first, a bit of context on why this is important to me, being awake, being asleep. Um, so as a freshman at Merton College, Oxford, I became a Christian, and my soul was doing lots of jumping jacks. And I was energized, and I was dynamic, and I was evangelizing friends, and I was organizing events, and I was leading prayer meetings, so much so that our College Christian Union made me their leader Within a few months, probably a mistake. Very exciting. But then months passed, and I find myself snoozing through my history masters and shuddering through my year teaching high school history, and my soul was longing for a nap. And I was going through the motions, and I was bored, and I was sleepy and sluggish. What happened next? We'll come back to that after spending some time with Samuel and Nathaniel. So we meet Samuel in our Old Testament reading, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. You remember. Now the boy, Samuel, was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim, so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. Who was Eli, a priest and a judge of the Israelites in the city of Shiloh. And the scene presented is very suggestive of spiritual sleepiness. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. And this sense of sluggish decline is underlined by the description of Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see. A lack of vision. Things were growing dark. Eli is lying down in his own place. Verse 3. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. The lamp of God, this physical thing that has a flame, perhaps has metaphorical overtones in the narrative, the light and leadership of God was still there if dimly perceived. And this lamp of God is associated with Samuel, described as lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Wow. The presence of God, the ark of God, he's sleeping there, unsupervised. Is God present, nearby, in the midst of this spiritual sleepiness? And it's the boy, Samuel. Think of my own nine-year-old son going to sleep in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, where would he keep his Pokemon cards? And what did he sleep on? An air mattress? 
I mean, there's the joke. An air mattress is great when you want to sleep on the floor, but not right away. For those who have done youth group mission trips, knows what that's like. And we think about that, a nine-year-old boy, far from family, lying alone as the flickering lamp of God had not yet gone out, where the ark of God was. And just pausing by the ark, one of our books for the D-Men class with Rob Steady this week, On Christian Theology by Rowan Williams, has the chapter, Between the Cherubim, the Empty Tomb, and the Empty Throne. And Williams notes that angels at the tomb in John's Gospel are seated one at the head and the other at the feet of the grave slab, which recalls, of course, the mercy seat of the ark flanked by the cherubim. He writes, the cherubim flanking the ark define a space where God would be if God were anywhere. Where God would be. If God were anywhere, then the Lord called Samuel and he said, here I am, and ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. And as you remember, this happens three times, the call and misdirected response before Eli wakes up to the possibility that it is the Lord who is calling the boy. Verse 9, therefore Eli said to Samuel, go, Lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. The Lord is making himself present in the darkness. Why? He is poised to act. Behold, I am about to do a thing. What is this thing? It is the judgment of Eli and his sons. Eli, guilty of the dereliction of his duty, and his sons who abuse their religious power to satisfy their carnal cravings. Samuel must have known. Kids aren't blind. And this judgment was foretold in chapter 2 and enacted in chapter 4, the following chapter. But what has this got to do with us? Because we're observing the sleeping Samuel called forth. And the Lord speaks in the darkness, and he is poised to act. And with that in mind, we move to our second character, as the Lord calls forth the seated Nathanael. This is back in John's Gospel, chapter 1. After Jesus called Philip, Philip found Nathanael and brought him to Jesus. Verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you. Under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The Lord saw Samuel and called him and shared with him the plans for coming judgment. The Lord was poised to act. And the Lord saw Nathanael and called him through Philip and gave him a glimpse of future glory he is poised to act. You will see heaven opened. And the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Except we don't. Now, I've read John's Gospel. There is no scene in which Nathaniel observes angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is a lovely evocation of Jacob's dream from Genesis 28, establishing Bethel, the house of God, but we don't see angels in John's gospel anymore, or do we? At the very end, in the confused, empty darkness of the tomb, 
Mary sees angels. She saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And the Lord is poised to act. Mary sees angels, but who does she then see? She turns and sees someone she doesn't immediately recognize. But this someone who knew Samuel and called him by name, who knew Nathaniel as he sat under the fig tree, says, Mary. Then she knows him, the someone who knows you and has called you by name. For you are the third character called forth to here, to now, to this week, to this year, and he is poised to act. The tomb is empty. The Lord is alive. What might he do? What might you see? Maybe some clear act of judgment on leaders who have failed morally and have blasphemed his name. Maybe some beautiful scene showing the reconciliation of heaven and earth in the life of one you hold dear. He is poised to act. We may see him in the outer world. We may experience him in our inner world right here. Returning to my own story, which I think I left myself in a mess, um, sleeping through my master's and not sleeping at all during my history teaching. And I ended up applying for an InterVarsity mission team uh, role in Milan, Italy. And the night before flying out, uh, fly, flying out, I was at a conference, and it was Friday night, and it was a big room, and light and warmth, and lots of people and joy. And then I had to go back to my room. And I stepped out into the dark. No moon, no stars. It was the literal can't see the hand in front of your face darkness. And as I stepped forward into this dark and lonely unknown, I thought, wait, this is an encapsulating bigger moment of my life. Leaving the country I know and stepping into the unknown, into the darkness, and I was surprised to hear my soul say this. Well, Jesus, I guess it's just me and you now, and that's okay. It's okay. He sees you and hears you and knows you and knows what you need this year. And you'll see him at work in the world around you. And you'll experience him in your inner world too. How is your inner world? How is your soul this morning? Awake, active, communing with the Lord? Wonderful. Or snoozing, sleepy, drifting off. As with Samuel, the Lord is near. Draw near to him as he draws near to you. He has things for you to see this year. Let me finish with a quote from Maximus the Confessor that Dr. Sturdy shared with us yesterday. The word of God, born once in the flesh, such as his kindness and goodness, is always willing to be born spiritually in those who desire him. In them he is born as an infant, as he fashions himself in them by means of their virtues. He reveals himself to the extent that he knows someone is capable of receiving him. He diminishes the revelation of his glory, not out of selfishness, but because he recognizes the capacity and resources of those who desire to see him. May we desire to see him and hear him and know him this year. Amen.